um, chapter 18. Um, and there's so much that I want to cover in here um, that I don't really have enough time to read it. And so I want to try to give you a brief overview. And it might be a familiar story, but I want to give you a brief overview. I am blessed. I know it. Um, I want to give you a brief overview of this story. That way I can kind of break down what I believe that God is revealing. Listen, um, all of you on this stream tonight, I can say this with, with confidence and boldness that you are anointed by God. Um, you are called by God. You have a gift on the inside of you. Some of you have already started unwrapping. Um, some of you, that gift is still lying wrapped. Uh, some of you are combing through layers of wrappings to get uh, down deep to the inside and the core and the root of what that gift is. Listen, I want to encourage you tonight that what you have on the inside of you, God is calling out on purpose. Uh, he's very intentional about pulling this thing out. Some of the things that you're encountering in your life is a direct result of what God put on the inside of you. And there are some ways that he pulls it or he chooses to pull these things out of you. What I want for you this evening is for you to come out of hiding. What I want for you this evening is for your eyes to be open, for you to realize, God, there is something on the inside of me that is bigger than me. I can't contain it. I can't hold it to myself. Sometimes I don't even know what to do with it. Sometimes it's encouraging. Sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes I feel inspired. Sometimes I feel like crap. But I know that there's something on the inside of me, God, and I just want you to use me. I just want you to get the glory out of my life. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we're talking about the prophet Elijah. Um, Y'all know Elijah, uh, the great man of God uh, who uh, was led by God, the, the one that everybody honored as the mouthpiece of God, who was the prophet of God, um, who was the one that everybody looked to for answers and solutions, uh, was ones that all of the enemies feared every time he walked into a city. Um, the great man of God, Elijah, we find him on a mountaintop experience in Eli in uh, First Kings chapter 18. This is going to get really good, y'all. First, uh, First Kings chapter 18. Um, I want to bring you up to par. Um, in verse, uh, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 18. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm trying, I got to slow down cause I got, there's a whole lot that I want to get out. And so I'm going to follow me. Chapter 18, verse one, it said, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself, uh, to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. This is after Elijah had already, um, this is after Elijah had already called uh, that there would be no rain. He had already called for a drought. The word of the Lord came to Elijah in chapter 17, verse one, uh, says, as sure as the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there should not be any dew or rain except at my word. We all know how the story goes. Elijah, uh, right after he prophesies and he says, hey, um, there's gonna be a drought. The word of the Lord comes to him, which is a word all by itself. He gives him the word, there's going to be a drought. Um, and then he, the word of the Lord comes to him and tells him to go to the brook. After the brook dries up, then God provides again um, with a lady, uh, with a widow, right? We know how that story goes. When we get to, to chapter 18, he says, now go present yourself to Ahab. Just in case you don't know who Ahab is, Ahab works for Jezebel. Just in case you don't know who Jezebel is, Jezebel is the one who is killing all the prophets of God, arguably even worse than Paul, but we're going to just put them on the same level, um, persecuting not only Christians, but going after the prophets of God. So the word of the Lord comes to Elijah and he says, go present yourself. Y'all follow me on this. We're coming out of hiding tonight. He says, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So you're thinking, OK, God is sending Elijah to Ahab, who works for Jezebel. He's sending him there with good news. This is going to be good, right? I'm sending you to the enemy, but I'm sending you with good news. So this might go well. God, I'm okay with using my gifts as long as it comes with good news. God, I'm okay with you using me to prophesy as long as it's a gentle word. God, I'm okay with you using me to get outside of my comfort zone as long as it's in an area where I'm comfortable. God, I'm okay with you using my gifts as long as it's in a vein um, that I desire to do or something that I like doing. But anytime that you veer me off uh, of what's comfortable. Anytime you veer me outside of what I'm used to or what's normal, then they start to get a little edgy. This is what happens. He sends Elijah um, to Ahab 
And then uh, let's see. Let's see where I want to start. Man, there's so much in here. It's so much in here. Um, it starts at verse 20. Again, I can't go there uh, because it's just so much to read, but I just need to give you an overview really quick. First Kings 18, it starts at verse 20. We know how it goes. Um, Elijah gets to the city, presents himself to Ahab. And then he says, hey, you got 400 prophets of Baal. You got 400 prophets from somewhere else. And all of these 800 prophets, false prophets, right, are worshiping their idols. He puts them to a competition and he says, OK, take all of your prophets and then he says in verse 22, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord. So we see here that Elijah is the only prophet standing up against, let's say, about 800 false prophets. Let's stop right there. For a lot of y'all, y'all would have ran right there. That would have been the point of reference or, or point of contact for you to take off running, for you to go into hiding, right? Even before God has an opportunity to do a miracle, that would have been the point for you to leave, for you to say, man, I'm the only Christian on my job. I'm the only believer in my family. I'm the only one in my city. I'm the only one in my neighborhood. I'm the only one on my street that's taking a stand for God. Why am I the only one? Elijah finds himself as the only one, but he doesn't go into hiding. Matter of fact, this thing gives him confidence. He's like, he, he almost gets a little bit cocky. He's right on the borderline of arrogance where he says, take all of your prophets, all of your idols, and we'll have a little competition. We're going to throw some bulls on some wood. And any and the God that answers by fire will call him the one and true living God. He'll be the Lord God, capital L, capital G. He will be the Lord God that will worship, that will serve the one that answers by fire. And so Elijah says, OK, it's one of me. It's 800 of you. Let's see who God's uh, who's God answers. If you come through through that chapter in chapter 18. Again, I don't have too much time because I need to give more impartation than I do need to uh, to teach it tonight because I got to encourage you tonight. You'll find out, long story short, we already know, know how this goes. Um, they cry out to their gods, to their idols. They scream, they dance, they even cut themselves with knives, do everything within their natural ability that they know to do with idols as false prophets and, the, and their gods don't answer. We know what Elijah does. Again, tiptoes the line of cockiness, right? He pours water on the wood. We know that water and wood, when you're trying to light a fire, is not a good mix. Not only does he uh, throw water on the wood, but he throws water around a trench around the wood as well. So even if the wood catches fire, the water around it still might put it out. He calls on God. Lord God consumes everything, sweeps it up, licks up everything till everything is completely dry. And then everybody says, wow, his, his God is Lord. Right. It doesn't end there. So Elijah takes all the prophets. He has them all executed. This is where it gets really tricky. This is where it gets crazy. Um, so then after he has them executed, this is the part that we probably come to know. Then Elijah said to Ahab in verse 41, go up and drink. And there is a sound of abundance of rain. Watch this, y'all. Watch this, because this is where this is where some of us are. Right. Um, we preached this past Sunday. Come out of hiding. We've been on this series about Holy Spirit. We've been sensing, we've been feeling this momentum. Some of you have been experiencing maybe in your personal lives, um, this momentum that we've been gaining in the spirit. You've been coming familiar with your spiritual gifts, with your abilities, with your talents, um, with, with what you have on the inside of you, with, with what's within your, your, your reach, with the, what type of people you can reach, um, with what God put on the inside of you, starting to see those things unfold right before your very eyes, right? Um, starting to exemplify and, mod uh, and, and model uh, the gifts of the Spirit, right? We're building momentum. Elijah has this great, this massive victory, this mountaintop experience. But then it gets better. He says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. This is amazing to me because he hears the sound of abundance of rain in a drought. Right. Come out of hiding, y'all. Come out of hiding. Right. You can be in a drought. You can be in a season where everything seems like chaos. You can be in a season um, where there's an economic crisis. We, we can be in the middle of a pandemic, a brand new pandemic, more than the one that's just been going on the last year and a half or so. Right. We can be in the middle of all of this and still be able to hear God clearly in the midst of a drought. He says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Right. So then he sends up a servant to go look. And then eventually we know that's not where I'm going with this. But eventually he goes out, he looks, he say, hey, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. 
It's coming up. The rain floods the area and the rain comes, right? In answer prayer. I say all of this to say this, to get to this part right here. He experiences a mountaintop, uh, a mountaintop victory, right? Where he kills the, he, he defeats the prophets all by himself, standing as the sole prophet of God and defeats these, these four to 800 false prophets, right? Mountaintop experience, a great victory. Then he hears the sound of abundance of rain. Three years after um, the city has been in drought, then he hears a word from the Lord and then God sends the rain, right? He's constantly in a mode of hearing God and then seeing it happen. Hearing God, seeing it happen. Hearing God, seeing it happen. Y'all follow me? Hearing God, seeing it happen, right? He's building momentum, mountaintop experience, this great big victory. And guess what happens? There's not a celebration. He's not excited about this. He's not happy. Um, he doesn't throw a party. Um, he doesn't run around screaming like, look what God just did and he's about to do greater things. This is what happens in chapter 19. Immediately following this mountaintop experience, I'm about to call a bunch of us out of hiding tonight. It says in Ahab, Ahab was a, was a, uh, was a servant of, um, of Jezebel, right? And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Let me make it clear. Ahab went to Jezebel and he told her everything that Elijah had done and that Elijah had executed all the prophets of Baal. And, and then Jezebel said, OK, well, I'm going to kill you. Your life now is in my hands. Um, I'm putting a bounty on your neck. Right. This is what this is, uh, this is. This would be extra right here. This is what I also find interesting. Ahab saw God answer by fire and believed in God in that moment. But then when he gets in front of Jezebel, the only thing that he tells Jezebel is he killed all our prophets. Why didn't Ahab tell Jezebel that God answered by fire? Right. That's 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 just an extra bit right there. Right. So we see there that Ahab, for whatever reason, didn't want Jezebel to know that God was real and that God had been doing these amazing things. Nevertheless, it says in the very next verse, and when he saw, talking about Elijah, he rose and ran for his life. This is where I want to pour into you right here. It says that Elijah ran for his life. Somebody say ran for his life. Now, it doesn't say he got discouraged, so he encouraged himself in the Lord. It doesn't say that, um, you know, he was feeling down. It wasn't saying that he had a bad day. It wasn't saying that, you know, he needed a little pick me up. It said he ran for his life. He was afraid that he would be killed. Listen to me tonight. Maybe you're not running for your life, but maybe you're running from your calling. Whoop. Maybe you're not running for your life tonight, but maybe you're running from your calling. Maybe you're running from the anointing on your life. Maybe you're running from your gift. What, what, are you, what are you running from tonight? What are you hiding from tonight? What, 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 is it that, what is it that God has called you to that scares you so much that it has you running for your life? Did you not just experience a mountaintop victory? Did you not just see God do something incredible? Are you not experiencing this momentum? Did he not speak to you through a dream? Did he not come to you in a revelation? Did he not come to you to you in a prophetic word? Everything that God spoke to Elijah, he saw the immediate manifestation after it happened. He said, hey, there's going to be a drought. The drought happens. He says, hey, go to this brook. The raven provides food. Hey, go to this widow. The widow provides food. Then he says, all right, go present yourself to Ahab, the prophets of Baal. He sees victory, victory after victory, after victory, after victory. We're seeing this momentum and we're on this mountaintop experience. But then in it, he runs for his life. How is it that you can believe God to stand up against 800 prophets by yourself, but then run from this one woman? Think about that. Never let the voice in your head become louder than the voice of God. Listen, I, man, there's no way in the world that you could try to convince me that he was afraid of Jezebel. After you just stood up to 800 prophets that worked for her, after you just stood up to Ahab, her servant, what more could she do to you? Your life was not in your hands. God has you. So what are you afraid of? What are you running from? 
If he did it before, he can do it again. I always say this too, but if he does it again, he might do it in a different way. So why is it that you won't allow God to do it in a new way, but you have to have control over what's going on in your life? No, just let him do it. Stop running. Come out of hiding. For some of you, it's a fear of failure. For some of you, it's a fear of shame. I'm, I'm ashamed of my past. It's, it's kind of like, you know, political leaders. I had a conversation with a guy one time said, um, you know, we were talking about different political beliefs. Um, and, he, and he said, well, why can't we take this old president and this new president and kind of mix them together? Like, why can't we take his style, his swag, his energy, his heart for people, but pair it together with a president that has that's business savvy, that's about money and, 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 and that can bring um, that can bring in resources? Like, why can't we mess those two people together? And what he said was those two people don't exist. And or they exist, but they have so much shame and so much history that when they run for the office of president, that they're going to go back, review their history and they're going to find some stuff that they don't want to come out. So they're OK with living life comfortably as not to expose the things that are hidden in the closet. I hope that makes sense to you all tonight. They they in fear that things might be exposed they have controlled, uh, they have limited, they have diluted their lives to comfortable in fear that things that they've done in the past may come out. What are you afraid of? There is no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame in anything that you have done. You are covered in the blood of Jesus. You are covered by grace. What are you hiding from? What are you running from? After he just had this great victory... Now it seems like he sinks into depression. I don't know about y'all, man, but I've, I've experienced this before where it feels like just as you have this great spiritual victory, it seems like then you experience this great natural valley. And it's like, I, I don't know what it is about this contrast or about kind of this roller coaster ride of things that happen in the spirit versus natural. And it seems like sometimes when you're in the valley, then, then it seems like then a miracle happens and God just kind of supernaturally picks you up. In this moment, he has a great victory, but then he sinks into a very low depression, right? Sinks into a very low depression. This is what happens sometimes. You know, we, we, we fear sometimes that our best days are behind us, right? Um, and so oftentimes when God does something amazing in our lives, um, then we feel like, God, I don't know how you can outdo this. God, I didn't even believe that you could do this in my life. And so how is it that you're going to do even more exceeding abundantly above all that I could ask or think? How are you going to do greater than what I've experienced up to this point? Because I've seen you do some big things. So how are you going to how are you going to do better than that? And so you sink into a depression because you feel like, all right, well, my best days are behind me. Your best days are still ahead. You've not seen your best days. You've not seen the best you. You've not seen your anointing operate at full capacity and full mass. You've not seen the Holy Spirit bubble up on the inside of you and you let that thing loose like you know that you're supposed to. You've seen it trickle out a little bit. You've seen bits and pieces, but you've not seen the real you. What you see in the mirror is not your, what you see in the mirror. You're seeing dimly. You're seeing a blurred image. You're seeing through a shade, right? But, but God wants you to see yourself in the spirit. And that's what you'll see as a clear image. He feared, he had a fear of reality. All right, God, I see in the spirit, but I also see the reality, the nature of my situation. Oh my God, y'all hear me in this. Listen, I believe his fear was that he saw reality more than what he saw in the spirit. He saw, OK, the reality that the, the, the reality of my situation is that my life is in danger, that I could very well die from this. This is the reality. Um, but the spiritual aspect, the, the truth, right? There's truth and there's reality. The reality is I might die. She is after my life. I need to run and hide. The truth about the matter is I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. My grace is sufficient. Just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Just as I was with Jacob, I will be with you. Just as I was with Abraham, I will be with you. Just as I was with Isaac, I will be with you. That is the truth about the matter, regardless of what the reality of it looks like. Oh my God, if I can get this out the way that I feel it. Sometimes the most gifted, the most genius um, people, the most creative people, sometimes we call them creatives or even genius, um, I did this research in my psychology class some years ago and I found out 
um, they were kind of pairing or comparing why is it that some of the most creative or the most genius people have a higher rate of suicide, especially in entertainment, um, in music, in, in movies, um, now with, um, with, with digital content creation even, right? Why do they seem the most stressed out, the most depressed, and statistically sometimes the most suicidal? And this is what I found in that class is that the t statistics were way up for those who had the most gifts, most creative, those that were exploring um, their spiritual uh, asset. And I say spiritual loosely because it could also be dipping into the other side of the spiritual realm, right? That's ungodly. Um, but those that explore those realms, they experience a higher suicide rate because um, they created a world in their mind without restraint. And so anytime they have to come back to reality, they can't handle reality. Oh my God, I'm saying a whole lot tonight and I hope y'all understand what I'm saying. I'm trying my best to break this down. They're very good at creating almost an alternate reality. One in which they can create any and everything that comes to mind. Anything that they envision, they can see it, they can establish it, they can create it. They hate hearing the answer, no. They don't like rules. They don't like laws because they always see and envision loopholes around them. And any time that they're boxed in with reality, they lose it because they don't know how to function in reality. They don't know how to function in normal. They don't know how to function with rules. They don't know how to function uh, within a box. And so any time that their reality um, meets their um, virtual reality, I guess I could say, Anytime that these two, two things clash and they get mixed up and confused, then they lose themselves. They lose themselves in theology. They lose themselves in their thoughts. They lose themselves in their knowledge to where they almost talk themselves out of believing in God because they have to take their mind off of something. But they're too creative to take their mind off of anything. I hope that this makes sense to you tonight. Listen, Elijah lost himself because the voice of Jezebel was more, much louder than the voice of God. He was used to hearing God speak and seeing manifestation. But when he heard Jezebel, he allowed fear to take over where there should have been faith to know, God, you got me. God, you're going to handle this. God, you're going to take care of this. I can come out of hiding with confidence, knowing God that you have settled it within me, that I already have victory even before I get into the fight. Glory to God. It's almost like what I read this, this, this past Sunday with Adam. Who told you? Whose voice are you listening to? Right. God didn't tell Adam and Eve that they were naked. He didn't expose that to them. He never told them to hide. He never told them that they should be ashamed. Right. God never told um, uh, Elijah that he would die. He never told Elijah that he would not get victory over Jezebel. He never told um, Elijah that he would fall by the sword. He never told him. So who told you? Who told you that you were going to fail? Who told you that you were going to lose? Who told you that you weren't good enough? Who told you that you didn't have the gift? Who told you that you couldn't make it? Who told you that it was too big, that it was too far, uh, that you didn't have the resources, that you didn't have enough money, that you weren't right, the right skin complexion? Who told you that you were too young, that you were too little? Who told you that you were too good? That you were too witty? That you were too creative? That you're too loud, that you're too strong, that you're too much. Who told you? And then compare what they told you to what God told you, right? Those 800 prophets of Baal to this one prophet, Elijah, and it weighs on the scale. And Elijah made way much heavier because he had truth. Who told you? This is where the filling of the Holy Spirit comes into place, because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't dip into depression. When you're full on the Holy Spirit, you're not lacking joy. You're full of joy. You're full of life. Right. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't retreat. You take the battle heads on because you already know there's victory on the other side. Who would dare back down from a fixed fight? Does that even make natural sense? Who would dare back down from a fight that they already know that they're about to win? 
Who in their right mind watching a movie knowing how the war is already going to end in victory, but still would cry about these small moments uh, of losses knowing that they would have the win in the, in the end, right? You've already seen the end. You already know how this is going to appear. We know that we got victory on the other end. Listen, filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about constantly drinking the Holy Spirit, constantly praying in the spirit, constantly reading the word of God and, and, and pouring it into yourself, constantly uh, fulfilling and walking uh, and exemplifying the fruits of the spirit, constantly, um, uh, constantly walking in the spirit to avoid the temptations of the flesh, right? Being filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis so that we don't retreat, so that we can discern and see the truth between the lies, so that now when we look at reality, we'll look through the we'll look through the filter of the Holy Spirit. So when everybody else sees, hey, there's a drought, you know, no, but I hear this sound of abundance of rain. Hey, there's a pandemic. Yeah, but I, all I hear is prosperity. Yeah, but but don't you know there's an economic crisis? Well, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. Where, where God, where have you stored it? Where do I need to look? Right. You'll see things through the filter of the Holy Spirit. Instead of through your reality, because if you look through the lens of reality, you'll be tempted every time you'll fall apart every time you'll weep when you watch the news. You'll be in conversations about people um, talking about they, 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 they got the, they caught the, the Delta variant and, and, and you'll weep along with them instead of praying for them and saying, nope, this will not end in death. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than any disease, any ailment, any pandemic, uh, anything that would try to come up against us. Right. And when you see through the filter of the Holy Spirit, right? This is what he says in, in chapter 19, verse seven, and I'm almost finished. It says, an angel of the Lord came back a second time. This is after Elijah fled and he ran to Beersheba. It says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. An angel of the Lord came to him. He, he, he fled for his life, camped out under a tree. Angel of the Lord said, hey, get up, eat. Elijah ate, went back to sleep, just left himself to die. Literally, he said, why don't you just take my life? Y'all got to go back and read this. This is so good. Angel of the Lord appears to him a second time and he says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Listen to me tonight. Y'all here, perk up your ears, your, your spiritual ears for this one right here. Listen, the Holy Spirit sometimes will give you very spiritual instructions. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you something very practical. Sometimes it'll give you something very spiritual and deep, and sometimes it'll give you something very practical. Sometimes it'll give you something that 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 you'll feel like, wow, like this is this is so deep. Holy Spirit, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to give me a strong foundation to carry out this one. And then sometimes he's gonna give you something so practical that you're gonna be like, was that you? I feel like I just made that up because that just seems very natural, right? Angel of the Lord appears to him and he says, Rise and eat. This is what you have to take into consideration. Elijah has been in a drought. He calls for rain. But then when he says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, it does not say. And even when he told um, his servant to go up and eat and drink, it doesn't say that Elijah went up with him to eat and drink. It says now I hear the sound of abundance of rain, but nowhere in there does it say that he drunk. Then when he fled from God, he fled a day's journey. So it, 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 we know that he's gone at least an entire day. But up until that point, we don't remember the last time that he ate. It might have been with him when he was with the widow, right? So he's gone a while without eating. Now he finds himself in a depressed state, right? Depression, right? If anybody's ever been depressed before, you know, man, I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't. My, 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 my dreams are all over the place. Like I'm out of my normal routine, right? He's lying under this tree, left himself to die, and he can't eat, can't digest anything. And the angel of the Lord says, eat. Arise and eat something very practical. And you think, oh, you know, voice of the Lord needs to come to him and tell him, hey, arise and go back there and do what I told you to do. No, he gives him something very practical. He says, arise and eat. Listen, I got I to gotta help some. I got to help. I'm about to say some of y'all. I got to help some of us come out of hiding. What Holy Spirit speaks to you might be something very practical that he's telling you to do. Might be something super practical, but you say, nah, but I'm waiting for you to say something spiritual. God, if you just give me something heavy, if you give me something deep, if you give me a prophetic word, if you show it to me in a dream, if you give it to me in a vision, and I can believe Holy Spirit is probably sitting back like I told you seven times already. Why is it that you, do, you believe that you can run with the spiritual thing, but you can't even do the practical thing? He said, I need you to do something very practical. He said, I need you to put food in your body you haven't eaten. 
So even, even before I give you this spiritual instruction, if you've not done the practical thing, then your practical, your natural body won't even be able to hold itself up to be able to fulfill the spiritual thing that I'm telling you to do. So please do the practical thing that I'm telling you to do so that you'll be able to sustain the spiritual instructions that are coming right after. Oh my God, I just said a whole mouthful. Please do the practical thing that the Holy Spirit is telling you to do so that you'll be able to sustain the spiritual instructions that he's about to give you. He says, arise and eat. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, it was prophesied over my life that Satan can't, take, Satan can't tempt you with women. Satan can't tempt you with an affair. Satan can't tempt you with drugs. Satan can't tempt you with alcohol. Satan is not getting to you through pornography or, or, or masturbation. Uh, Satan is not um, getting to you uh, through, um, um, through I, don't, I can't even think of any other temptations off the top of my head. You fill in the blank. The prophetic word came, uh, was spoken over me that Satan cannot get me with any of those temptations. And so they gave me a prophetic warning. They said, Satan is going to try to take your health. So I'm giving you a spiritual charge to begin to eat healthy so that your body can be in a position to be able to carry the spiritual weight of glory that is about to be poured out of you. Right. If he cannot get you with any other temptation, then he will take your health so that physically you will not be able to fulfill the call of God on your life. Listen, he gave me something very practical. I'm looking for the spiritual thing. I'm like, eh, eat healthy. What's that? I mean, like, God, why don't you? I, I need to hear a word that I'm ready to go to Africa. I, I need to hear a word that I'm ready to go to India. I need to hear a word that I'm ready to go to Brazil. I need to hear a word that you're about to use me to prophesy over the nations. I need to hear a word that you're about to put me on a stage or a platform before millions to proclaim the glory of God. I need to hear a word that you're about to use me to touch and to heal somebody's body. I need a word for myself to speak healing over my own body. But the only word that I got was eat healthy. So I started eating healthy. <laughs> The practical word might just be service your vehicle. Yeah, because I'm about to give you instructions to take a trip or I need you to go see somebody or I need you to go take care of somebody or you're about to get a call to go to a hospital and your vehicle can't even make it to where I need you to go. So practical insight that the Holy Spirit is getting, go service your vehicle, right? So if you don't do the practical thing, then he won't release the spiritual instruction because re releasing the spiritual instruction before you're doing the practical will leave somebody dead on the other end because you won't be able to make it there. So now I got to find somebody else that can do it. Now I got to find somebody else that can follow the practical instruction. Listen to me. Y'all, this is biblical. You'll find out that what happened after Elijah went through this whole battle and, and, you know, he experienced the earthquake and the fire and said, hey, God wasn't in none of that. Right after that, God gives him an instruction. He says, now I need you to go anoint Haziel. I need you to go and anoint Jehu and I need you to go anoint Elisha. We know who Elisha is. He said, I need you to go anoint these two people, but then anoint Elisha because he's going to take your place. Woo! He says, I need you now to go anoint two people, but then I need you to go anoint this third because he's going to take your place. I need somebody else to go in your stead because you can't handle the practical thing. So I know I can't believe I know I can't um, uh, believe in you to handle the spiritual thing. Y'all don't get me wrong. Elijah was a great prophet up until the day that he was swept away by the Holy Spirit up in heaven. Right. We know how that ended. But he said, yeah, but now I need somebody else to take your place. You've done everything that I told you to do up to this point. But now I'm ready for Elisha to take over. Now I need a fresh anointing. Now I need a fresh oil. Now I need I'm, I'm ready to do something fresh in the earth. I need somebody that's not afraid. I need somebody that's not going to back down from a little bit of opposition. Excuse me. I need somebody who's not going to look at the reality of the situation, but that's going to see it through the filter of the spirit and going to say, we can do this. We can handle this. No, the land, the people in the land are not too great. Yeah, the fruit is big, but I don't want to just enjoy the fruit. I want to be able to conquer the giants that are laying ahead of me. They're not just going to lay down and give it to me. Sometimes you have to fight. Sometimes it's going to be a battle for your life, but I need somebody who's going to fight for their life instead of just laying down and taking a loss. That's what you're looking for. Oh, man, I need something fresh. I need y'all to come out of hiding tonight. Listen, this is the last thing I'm going to share with you and I'm going to get ready to go. 
Oh my God, I'm gonna get stirred up on this last part. Holy, Holy Spirit, help me to get it out. And in um in First Kings chapter 19 verse three, it said when he saw that he when he saw talking about Elijah, he ran for his life to Bathsheba. Oh my God, this is deep right here. Y'all perk up your spiritual ears again for this part right here. This is heavy. Listen, it said he feared for his life, so he ran to Bathsheba. He feared for his life, so he ran to Bashir, Bathsheba. Beersheba. He feared for his life, so he ran to Beersheba. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all knew this already. Maybe some of y'all know this already. I don't know. But for me, I don't know. The Holy Spirit just called that to jump off the page of me earlier today as I was reading. And I said, man, I'm just curious. I wonder what Bathsheba means. I wonder what that stands for. I wonder what the significance of that is, because otherwise it would have just said that he ran. He fled for his life. Right. Or he found himself or he stopped that or he collapsed that Bathsheba. It says that he, he ran for his life and went to Bathsheba, which means that he was intentional about going to Bathsheba. He was very intentional about where he was fleeing to, even though he was experiencing a depression, even though he was running from God, even though he was running for his life. He was still very intentional about where he was running to. Listen, this is what Bathsheba means. It means a well of seven. Or the well of oath, right? It was a well, literally a water, a water well. But this was not just any well. This was a well where Abraham made an oath. This were an, this is this this is in the Bible. I'm sorry. Let me put my tablet. Make sure my tablet is on. Um, this 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 is where Abraham made an oath, right? And and Abraham built these wells, dug up the dirt all by himself. Y'all follow me on this. He built up, he, he dug up all of the dirt, built up all of these wells, right? Created an altar, essentially, if you will, right? And after Abraham, there was a great um, uh, famine. After Abraham, there was a great famine. And so then the Philistines who owned the land, after he died and they experienced this famine, they dumped the dirt back in the wells and they packed it in, right? No more wells. Abraham did this amazing, great thing and left for generations to come after him. But then they packed it in. No more wells. But then Isaac, his son, the one that he was about to sacrifice on the altar. He comes years later after Abraham died. And then Isaac rebuilds the wells. And then he calls it the same name, Bathsheba, that his father called the well. Y'all got to Y'all got to see this. Y'all follow me. Y'all follow me on this. Right. So then even in famine, he rebuilds it in famine. He rebuilds it. He rebuilds the well. But then he experiences problems. Follow me. He experiences problem building because then the Philistines are like, well, we didn't want to dig it up even in the famine. But because you dug it up, it's on our land. So we're going to claim it. We're going to repossess it. Isaac says, ah, man, I'm a little bit upset. But OK, he digs up another well. The Philistines come again. They say, hey, well, we didn't want to do the work for it. But we want the benefits. It's on our land, so we're going to repossess this well. He keeps going. Long story short, he rebuilds all of these wells, and then they make an agreement about these wells, right? This is where Elijah runs. Elijah runs to the place where Abraham built a well for generations to come. This was also the place where God met Isaac, where God made, met Abraham and said, I am with you. and." Let me make this very clear. Anytime that you are running from your problem in your situation, it is okay to run as long as you're fleeing and running into the presence of God. I know tonight some of y'all are probably feeling like, man, I'm running away from God. I'm getting away from this calling. I ain't doing this thing. I feel this heat. I feel this power. I feel this anointing. God, I know the gifts. I know the calling on my life. But I'm a run. I'm a run. You're not running away from God. You're running right into him. And if you're running right into him, I challenge you tonight to come out of hiding. And run into the well, run into Bathsheba, run into the well in the midst of a famine. When things are not going well, something that gives you depth to still be able to call on this well represents Holy Spirit, right? Living water out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. This water is no longer a well that we have to run into. 
So now when we're running to God, we don't have to find Abraham's well. We don't have to find Isaac's well. I think Jesus told the lady that he met at the well, you used to have to come to this place to worship. But now wherever you set up camp to worship is where the spirit of God sets up. What are you saying, Pastor Ty? The Holy Spirit living on the inside of you is that living well. So now when you feel like you want to flee from your problems, all you got to do is flee within yourself. Run within yourself. Call on the Holy Spirit within yourself. Fill up yourself, gird up yourself in the spirit, speak in tongues in your mo and build yourself up in your most holy faith, right? Run to Beersheba, run to that well on the inside of yourself, run to that place of refreshing. If you need to run back to the notes that you took before you was in trouble, if you wrote down the word that God spoke to you, run back to that word and remind yourself of what he spoke over your life. Remind yourself of who you are. Just like David had to go back after he encouraged himself. And he said, let me grab the ephod. Let me throw this thing back on. I forgot what it feels like to carry this anointing. I forgot what it feels like to pour out the Holy Spirit. I forgot what it feels like to walk in my God-given anointing and my God-given calling. I'm encouraging somebody tonight, sis, adjust, adjust your crown. Bro, adjust your crown. Put that thing on the right way. Put your ephod back on and walk in confidence. Yes, you can be confident and humble at the same time. I need you to walk in the building like you own the place. I need you to look at your situation as if God already did it. Right. Walk in there with authority like, all right, God, you already did this. So let's just go through the routine of whatever I need to do while I'm here. I need you to come out of hiding and embrace what God has called you to do. Run back to that foundation. All right, God, I need to go back. I, I remember a time when I was when I was seeking you. I was I was finding you where I was hearing you. I was knocking and the door was opening. You was answering my prayers and you were flooding me with your Holy Spirit. Find that place again. Go back to that prayer closet. Go back to that place where you first found him. God, restore the joy of my salvation just like David asked God to do in his life. Run back to that place where you first believed and say, God, all right, I need to go back to the basics. I need to go back to the foundation. I need to go back to the place where you showed me and you told me you would never leave me. You will never forsake me. You are with me and you ain't going nowhere. If I know you're with me, then I know I can handle it. I'm calling y'all out of hiding tonight. The calling on your life is much heavier than whatever opposition is coming up against you. There is nothing that can greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Who can stand against us? Who can compete with God? Who can box with his energy? Nobody. Spoiler alert. Nobody. Nobody. I'm calling you out of hiding whatever your fear is, whatever your hesitance is, whatever your timidity is. I'm calling you out of hiding. God is with you. His grace is sufficient. Whatever he has called you to do, he has already prepared you for. Glory to God. Whatever he put in you, he has already given you the tools for whatever will come up in the process. Glory to God. I encourage you tonight, man. I believe God tonight that somebody's coming out of hiding, that somebody's revisiting those fears, that somebody's revisiting an area where they told God no blatantly and bluntly. No, God, I can't do it. No, God, I'm not doing it. No, God, that's too much. No, God, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong girl. You got the wrong person. I'm, I, I believe that there's somebody tonight that's coming back to that place and saying, all right, God, let me revisit what you what, what I believe you told me to do. All right, God, let me go back to those notes that I wrote down that I'm scared to look at because I believe that it might actually come to pass. All right, God, let me, let, let me go back to that vision that I had a few years ago. Let me go back to that dream. Let me go back to that prophetic word. Let me go back to that feeling I used to feel when I was in your will and doing what you called me to do. I want to experience that again. I want to know what it feels like to decree a thing and to see that thing happen. I want to know what it feels like to have an anointing in my hand and to be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to know what it feels like to be able to discern and be able to pull out the truth out of a pile of lies. I want to know what it feels like to be able to walk in a prophetic anointing. I want to know what it feels like to be a teacher, to walk in the office, right? To walk in the fivefold ministry. I want to know what it feels like to walk in my God-given authority without any type of reservation. My God, it's nothing like it. It's nothing like it. I'm encouraging you not to just come out of hiding, but answer the call. 
Don't just come out of hiding making excuses. I need you to I need you to come out of hiding and answer the call on your life. And if you need help calling the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you know all things, you see all things. You know what I need. You know the answers, both practical and spiritual. You are my help. You are my provider. You are my reassurance. You are my comforter. You are my lawyer. You speak up on my behalf. You intercede for me. Holy Spirit, I need you. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I went well over my time that I allotted tonight, but I don't regret it at all because I know we needed to I know we needed to harp on it tonight. Listen, I want to pray over you tonight before we finish up. Father, I thank you for each individual on the stream tonight. God, I thank you even for those who may be watching at a later date that the anointing still carries the same weight. Father, I thank you for your anointing that you're meeting them right in their rooms, wherever they are right now, under the sound of my voice. I thank you for a special grace over their lives that will make it easy to answer the call. Yes, we'll have to fight through our minds. We'll have to, to battle through our emotions and our feelings and reservations. But I thank you for a grace that causes this to be a sweatless victory. God, I thank you that on the other side of this brick wall that we'll run through it and that we'll see ourselves in the spirit. We'll see through the lens of, of the Holy Spirit. We'll see you through the filter of how you see us. Thank you, God, that we'll walk confidently. We'll walk circumspect. We'll walk with authority. We'll walk with boldness because we know who we are in the spirit. Spirit man, rise up in the name of Jesus. Take your rightful position. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time to take your position. No more hiding. No more running. No more fleeing. No more indecisiveness. No more timidity. No more false humility. No more hiding or playing in the background. No more fading back to the shadows. No more fear of what people will say. No more fear of what my family will think. But being unapologetically anointed for the glory of God. God, I thank you for a distinct anointing, for clarity of gifts, for precision in the spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Woo! Glory to God. Listen, um, I hope that you guys are encouraged tonight. I thank you for streaming and tuning in tonight. If you know anybody who uh, will be encouraged or will be blessed by this message, I just ask that you would share. Um, if this message has blessed you tonight, I will also ask you to consider being a blessing to the ministry at flowinglife.org or via Cash App Flow Center. Um, but most importantly, man, listen, people just need to hear this word. The more Christians that can mount up and take their positions, the stronger the body of Christ will be. So I just ask you to tag somebody in this stream that you know can benefit from what was shared tonight or share it or take the link and text it to somebody, however you need to get it to them. Once it posts it on YouTube, uh, share it with them, but get this to somebody so that you can help and assist with the body of Christ mounting up and taking our position. Woo! I'm stirred up, y'all. Listen, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., continuation of the gift, this series about the Holy Spirit. And this Sunday, we're going to be digging into spiritual gifts. This is what we've been waiting for, I think. Some of y'all have been waiting. Some of y'all have been looking. All right, I need to know my spiritual gifts are. I'm ready to dig into it. I'm ready to dive in. Pastor Todd, why you been waiting so long? You're supposed to give us the list. You're supposed to give us details. You're supposed to let us know what our gifts are and how those look and how they apply and how they operate and how to function in them. It's coming. This Sunday, we digging in. So if you know anybody who needs to become acclimated with their spiritual gifts, Anybody who's interested in knowing what their spiritual gifts are, it's going to be spiritual, but it's going to be practical, too. I need to teach just as much as I need to preach it. If you know somebody who, hey, I don't even know what spiritual gifts are, but I'm, I'm interested in, in, in exploring, invite them in. It'll make sense to everybody. But we're digging deep this Sunday, 10 a.m. Looking forward to seeing y'all there, whether you're in person or part of our virtual family. Um, I love you guys. If you need anything from us, uh, myself or Lady Taryn, whether it's a prayer request whether you need us to be in agreement uh, with you about anything or everything, 
simply let us know. Reach out to us via email, info at flowinglife.org. Or if you have a personal contact, that'll work as well. Or if you're on social media, Facebook or IG, reach out to us. We'll be more than happy, more than glad to be able to pray with you and believe God with you and for you. We are always praying for you guys, um, specifically, not just vaguely and generally. Um, and I'm believing that God is about to stir some things up. Because once you become familiar with what your gift is, y'all about to take off. And I'm excited for y'all because I feel like y'all about to lose control in a good way. <laughs> Glory to God. Woo! Have your way, Lord. Um, y'all have a good evening. We love you. See you Sunday. Invite a friend to stream with you or invite a friend in person. Uh, we will see you soon.